Hello, everyone. This is the 45th episode of the Soccer Nostalgia Talk podcast. As always, this is Sean from Los Angeles, and I'm joined by Paul from Shipley in England. For this episode, we continue our interview series with Mr. Esteban Beckerman, Argentinian journalist, football history researcher, and professor of football history, as we discuss the history of Argentina football. Mr. Esteban Beckerman is an Argentina football historian and journalist professor at the Circulo de Periodistas Deportivas y en Taller de Investigación Historia sobre Football, Circle of Sports Journalists and Historical Research Workshop on Football. I don't know if I said that correctly, but... <laughs> yeah, perfect. <laughs> he is the founder of uh, entretiempos.com.ar center of football culture that includes the production of magazines, books, workshops, and consulting events. We aim to have this series of interviews with Mr. Beckerman, where we will examine the history of the Argentina football through the decades. Last time we left off just ahead of the 1920s with Argentina and neighboring Uruguay aging ahead of the continent internationally. For the 1920s and then early 1920s, their successes were on the home continent. However, this decade would see both nations receive international recognition on the world stage with the Olympic Games. We will examine this decade of the 1920s and its impact on Argentinian football history. Hello, Esteban. Welcome back. Thank you for joining us. Hi, Paul. Hi, Shehan. So to, to start off, uh, as we discussed last time, football in Argentina and Uruguay developed alongside each other. And this was the main rivalry in South America in the early 20th century. How important were the early South American championships and the foundation of CONMEBOL in expanding competition across the region? Well, it's a very important fact, and I think the first South American championships could show very early that a new kind of football were rising here in South America. Um, because Uruguay and Argentina played in a way that could lead them to achieve very important titles and honors along the decade and, and along the, the 20th especially. That way of playing football was really a key to understand the development of football here in Argentina and Uruguay. And it was like it growed along the South American championships history. And that championships lead to recognition, not only in other parts of the world, but especially here in Argentina and Uruguay. Because before that competition, that kind of football was already played here, but didn't have the recognition from the press, especially, that could get after the um, success Uruguay and Argentina achieved in that kind of tournament. And also with the tours of some teams through America and Europe. That was the real key to understand why the journalism here started to develop a mythical history or a new history of Argentinian football based on that, not only the technique or the skills of the players, but also in the cleverness of the Argentinian and Uruguayan players. That, that kind of stories that journalists started to tell in magazines like a graphic especially um, began to re-elaborate the story of Argentinian football itself. At this point, Argentina's rivalry was with Uruguay. But with the advent of the South American Championship, how did Argentina's historic rivalry with Brazil take shape? Well, the rivalry against Brazil started there in the first championships, but it really took some time 
for it to grow and to became what it is now. Because I think just in 1937, the Brazil national team could reach a real high level to confront Argentina and Uruguay with the same possibilities and the way it started to show in the fields in 1937 Copa America, it was like a real new beginning for that rivalry because it was some match or two matches really with uh, clashes and a lot of fighting between the players. And that was really the first match or, or the, the, the first moment in history where that rivalry came along or took place in a way that could lead us to give it really some real importance or maybe to put it on the same level than the rivalry Argentina had before with Uruguay only. How did the Argentinian league develop in the 1920s from its amateur and mainly British origins in the previous century? We spoke about teams like alumni last time. Which were the strongest clubs in this decade? Okay, in the 20s, Argentinian League took definitely the shape of an Argentinian League, really, because it started to have the teams we know at these days, like the most big or important here, like Boca, River, San Lorenzo, Racing, Independiente, Huracán, Vélez that kind of teams formed in the early century, the beginnings of the 20th century, by very young people and that already started to compete officially in the first decade of the 20th century, came to an enormous progress in that decade, had not only the chance to win titles and official titles in the first division, but also to show uh, football that was really good and different from the one that played that English teachers or masters they had. They started to play uh, trying to copy the way that English players or, or British players had, but they started to develop another way and they started to show that kind of skills and technique and cleverness that was with time shown by the press as the definition or, or the way to define the Argentinian and the Uruguayan way of playing this game, um, like the Rio de la Plata or Rio Platense football, no? And, well, that was really an important, a really important fact, and that could take to not only a definition, a new definition of the way of playing football here, but a definition also of the Argentinian and Uruguayan or Rio Platense identity. It was a new identity that took place and won the battle against that old identity of the football that we had in the early 20th century or, or in the first years of the decade. Were there reasons why Argentina did not participate in the 1924 Olympics, unlike its neighbor Uruguay? Oh yeah, here we almost always had uh, problems or issues that had to do a lot with incompetent or really selfish management or boards of the national football associations and also of the clubs. They were thinking almost always first in its very own benefit or, or in the benefit of their clubs, but not in the country benefit, not in the Argentinian football benefit. So that's really the reason. Um, but also it was important to understand that lack of Argentinian presence, the fact that Argentinian football was divided, was 
split it into two federations. You had by one side the Argentina Football Association, the, the old one formed by the British clubs or the, the clubs formed by British. On the other side, you had the Association Amateurs or Amateurs Association of Argentinian Football which was organizing championships in a parallel way than the official one since 1919. So from 1919 to 1926, the Argentinian football was divided in that two leagues. And it was like it could never form the real Argentinian national team in a way that could lead us to show the very uh, potential of Argentinian football. So that was also a reason to understand why Argentina did not go to the Argentinian Olympics of 1924, because they didn't want to show a lower version of the national team than the, they could have, than the one they could have shown if Argentinian football weren't divided. And how was that, the 1924 victory for Uruguay, how was that received at the Olympic Games? How was that received in Argentina? And what, what effect did that have on football in Argentina? Well, the, here the journalism really gave the title or success a huge importance because it showed us how the Rio de la Plata football could take the old world and could be recognized as the better or the football that was emerging in a way that will be recognized along the history. So here it was really very important for the development of Argentinian football. And it was like instantly that the Argentinian association try to form some national teams to confront Uruguay and to beat them. And they did. They did. Even in, in 1924, they put together a team to play with Uruguay and they did it. And Argentina beat Uruguay 2-1. to one. So that was the moment, I think, one of the moments most important here in Argentinian football history of that age, that decade, because it could be confirmed that Argentinian football was at the same level than Uruguay. It was like a, a moment of awakening or awareness of the notion that we could be the better of the world. And that triumph was really very remembered along the time because it was also the match where it was scored the first goal from a corner by Cesare Ansari. No, it, it's very important because of that reason also, the first Olympic goal. And it was also the match where it was for the first time used an Olympic net around the field, which is now here as Alambrado Olimpico, to separate the players on the field from the spectators. Well, it, it was very important for many reasons. And that net, it was used because uh, the first day that the match was settled, it couldn't be played because of the invasion of the field by the tremendous amount of people that was there in the stadium. It was really a huge mass of people that was not able to contain itself into the fines or, or the, the places where they should be. <laughs> and it, it was invading the field. Uh, well, it couldn't be played in the match and, and it was rematched a few days after because of that with the net. <laughs> Can you explain the background to Argentina's participation in the 1928 Olympics? Yeah, it was a really important participation of national leader here. That was Becar Varela, who 
really stand first for Uruguay in the 1924 and in 1928 also for the Argentina participation. He was also a key player for the integration of Argentina football in 1926. So we could show the world our best or our best national team at least. And well, it, it was that, that union between the leagues was formalized in 1927 and in 28 we could finally form a national team with the better players of Argentinian football and not only the ones of one league as we've been doing since 1919 in the South American Championships because of that split football, that two leagues that were organizing championships here. In 1928, we could finally go there to Amsterdam with national representative of the Argentinian football power. And it was shown early or earlier in the 1927 South American Championships, which was the first competition that Argentina won outside our own country. So that title also had a lot to do with that decision of Argentina going to the 1928 Olympic Games because we knew that we could do a good paper or a, a, do a good job there. Yeah, as you mentioned, this was um, this is a very strong squad that Argentina sent to the 1928 Olympics. Some of the better known players were Luisito Monti, Manuel Ferreira, Juan Evaristo, Raimundo Orsi, Roberto Cerro and Domingo Tarasconi. Most football historians know of Monti by virtue of being the first man to play in two World Cup finals for two different nations. But could you discuss some of those other players? Oh, yeah. It was really a good team and a very balanced one because it had the skills and the technique of Ferreira, who was really like a key player or, or a, a very talented player with the ball. And he not only played well, but also scored very beautiful goals and had uh, lots of technique and cleverness. But also it had the strength and the power of players like Monti or Tarasconi or Carica Berri from San Lorenzo who were really strong, really well physically in shape to play in that kind of competitions. They were really like uh, big ones. I think it was really well balanced. The technique we always try to, to show with that power and the strength or physical strength that also it's necessary to achieve great goals in, in football. And it's like only maybe some a major or, or more representative presence of the football of the provinces here because it, it was approved or it showed the way the board or, or the, the, the people that took the management of the Argentina National Football Association was thinking only in Buenos Aires and not in the provinces or the good level of the football we could see already in the 20s here in places like Rosario or even Santiago del Estero, Tucumán, where they were beginning to appear and to show some really good players. It was only one player who was selected and went to Amsterdam with the ones of Buenos Aires. He was Segundo Luna from Santiago del Estero, and he could not play even one match. He was really left apart from that team in a way really embarrassing, I think, because, well, we had Orsi, who was really a very good player, but Luna was also one really good player, and, and 
he could have measure or a minimum participation in that team. He was playing or he played before in the 1927 South American Championship. So it's really hard to understand why he was left apart, besides the fact that Orsi was really playing well. But well, maybe it was not a major problem there in the 28 Olympic Games, but more in the World Cup of Uruguay in 1930. That's the competition where, it, where that problem of unitarism and not presence of the interior players could have some major importance or maybe it was more unfair with them. Can you talk about Argentina manager, the Spanish-born Jose Lago Mian? How was such a relatively young man, I believe he was 35 years old, appointed as national team manager? Well, he was not really a coach or a trainer, but only to assemble the players and give them some tasks to do in the days before the match. No, so, uh, so more like a physical trainer, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, not like really a, a coach of, or a manager. He didn't select the players. The, the players were selected by the board, by the members of the... Technical uh, commission. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, not, not even a commission was formed <laughs> to select the players, but only to be there in, in the Supreme Council of Argentinian football was enough to have a vote or to vote the players that were going to be at the 1928 Olympics. The Olympics were to take place in May 1928 in Amsterdam. Argentina boarded the English ship Alcantara in March 1928. Now, we've heard stories of how the European nations kept fit on the long ocean voyage when travelling to the 1930 World Cup. How did the Argentinian squad manage to stay in shape on this long journey that they had? They trained in the boat first, in the the ship that were carrying them to Europe. And then in Europe, they also trained in the city where they were hosted. Uh, they didn't have a really good physical training at the time, and the football was not really developed in that physical area. So it was a big problem. You know? So I think that was not really the major uh, um, subject to attend or to care for them. It must be stressed that so dominant were Argentina and Uruguay at this stage that the prestigious El Grafico magazine had already predicted that the sides would reach the final. Was it self-evident to all, I mean, the European observers as well, that these two were the best football-playing nations? I don't think so. I, I don't think Europeans could see really it coming in 1928 as, as they, but also they did see it coming more than in 1924. In 1924, no one expected Uruguay to win the Olympic Games. Even Uruguay <laughs> didn't expect that. So uh, I think in, in 1928, some of the journalists could think there in Europe that, well, maybe Uruguay could still show or showing a great football, but not maybe here uh, or Argentina to do the same. But I think it's an important antecedent or, or a, it's, a, it's really important to, to have in count that before that Olympic Games, Boca was touring through Europe in 1925, and that tour was really also very important for the people and journalists in Europe could see that Argentinian teams had also a great level. Boca had a huge success in that tour, and well, that could lead some of that journalists in Europe to think 
Argentina also had a, a very great football. There's another story from this uh, Olympics. Uh, Argentina were initially stationed in Duin, close to Amsterdam. And there's a story that they had to relocate to Harlem because the players were taking shots at the swans near their hotel. Do you know if this is a true story? Oh, I don't know. I don't know really, but I think it could be perfectly true. <laughs> it could be true or it could be one of the football urban myth legends. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. In the Olympics, Argentina qualified to the final with comfortable wins over the United States with a score of 11-2, Belgium 6-3. In these two matches, Tarasconi scored four goals in consecutive matches and also Egypt 6-0 where Tarasconi again scored a hat-trick. So he scored a hat-trick or more in three consecutive matches. Were Argentina just better footballers or were they tactically superior as well? And can you discuss their general tactics as well? Yeah, it's really interesting to see how Tarasconi was scoring so much goals in that match. It shows an interesting fact that was that in Argentina football at that time, the central forward was not really a player who played really in front of the net or to play goals only, but most like a playmaker, Ferreira, who was the center forward in the Olympics, was really like a, a number 10, as we know here, the player that could make some plays or could not only score, but also to make a lot of, of, of moves to other players to score. So Ferreira was playing really like a false nine, maybe if you want to call it that way. And Ferreira was beginning its play from the middle field even in most of the time or, or the matches. And that led Tarasconi to take the place of central forward or maybe to be really there where the rivals were not expecting him, maybe, because he formed in the team as a right winger or an insider, not as a center forward. The center forward was Pereira. But Tarasconi was really the real center forward or the real scorer, the real man to score there in that team. And it has a lot to do with the type of football that was played here in Argentina at that time. We had that kind of pilot central forwards. They were known as pilots here because they were managing the, the attack in all the teams, maybe, not only in the national team. And well, Ferreira was, I think, the, the best one of that time and could show that in the Olympics and also in the 1930 World Cup. So it was really interesting to see that, to see that way of football that started to develop in the first 20s, in the first years of the decade, and that defined a lot the artistic way of Argentinian teams and also of the Uruguayan teams. But Uruguay also had Petrone, who was a really more power or a really more scoring only center forward, not, not the one with more skill than the Finnish. No, I think Argentina had at that time a more artistic way of playing than Uruguay. Having qualified comfortably, the final between the neighboring powerhouses took place on June the 10th at Amsterdam's Olympic Stadium. Pedro Petrone gave Uruguay the lead, but Manuel Ferreira tied the match early in the second half. The final ended as a 1-1 draw and needed a replay. The reports were that Argentina had the better of the play in the second half. Do you think they let this chance out of their grasp? And what's the consensus of Argentinian football historians? Yeah, a lot of stories were was written about that. And the most interesting story is that one that tells that the Argentinian 
left insider uh, Gain Sarain at that first uh, final match with Uruguay was left alone against the Uruguayan keeper in the final minute, the very final of the match. And he, well, maybe chickened out or, <laughs> or, or had a, a moment of doubt. And, and well, he, he only should a really low shoot to that lead or, or maybe it was not the best way to give Argentina the triumph. No, but it was a moment really remembered here for a very long time. That one when Gansarain had the, the triumph in his foot and he couldn't achieve that. And it was so important and it was told also that uh, Gain Sarain at that very night tried to kill himself in the hotel because of that uh, missed opportunity to give Argentina the title. He was really guilty, he, he felt really guilty for that missing opportunity. The replay was played on June 13th. Once again, Uruguay took the lead, this time by Figueroa in the 17th minute. In offside. <laughs> in offside. Oh. <laughs> it was, it was a, a really clear offside as the cranks here. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, Luisito Monti tied the match in the 28th minute. Uruguay would score the winner in the 72nd minute through Scarone and yeah. won their second successive Olympic title. What was the reaction of the Argentine press and public? Well, here, knowing that the first match was really dominated by Argentina, it was not a surprise that the second one was also a one that Argentina deserved to win most than Uruguay. The reaction was that we never uh, had been very good losers. <laughs> and we think at that time, and, and it was told for a long time here, that Argentina deserved more, or Argentina deserved more than Uruguay to win that title. That was the, the reaction. And, and it was also told that the public in Amsterdam was cheering for Argentina because they were considering Argentina deserved to win, but that, that couldn't be proved <laughs> in any way now. But well, that, that was the reaction. It, it was that, well, we will have them later, another, another time. They, they won because of they had more expertise, maybe, in the final or in, a, in an Olympic game than us. But, but that, the reaction was having to do a lot with that uh, kind of losing <laughs> we always have here. When, when we know we play better than, than the rival, but we, we couldn't achieve the title or won because of some not only footballistical explanation. As a side note to this, England refused to participate in the Olympics due to the issue of professionalism. But how do historians feel England would have fared against the South American nations? Was, was English football still a, a reference point in Argentina at the time? Yeah, because we know the capacity of football players, because not only of the um, masters or, or the teachers we had in the early 20th century, but also because of the tours some English teams were having to Argentina and Uruguay in that time. But in the 20s, maybe the power or, or the quality of that team that toured to Argentina and Uruguay was not the same than the one it, they had in the first decade and the two first decades of the 20th century. So maybe that was a reason for the fact that Argentinian football could feel that they could beat them in, if they would have played with them. 
but also we, we respected them a lot. We knew how professionalism was developed in England and how the key players of England football were receiving lots of money to play. And that really was unusual characteristic here and, and was the reason for us to give that player some importance or some faith in the press also. Here in the press was informed when a player in England was taking good money. Because of his successes in the Olympics, Raimundo Orsi earned the nickname El Cometa de Amsterdam. Mm-hmm. He was signed on the spot by Juventus's Eduardo Agnelli. At that point, did Argentinian Federation officials fear an impending exodus or was this regarded just an isolated incident? No, no, they, they were fearing an exodus because they even tried to stop Orsi to go to Italy. Orsi had to come back here because it was a settled, a new rule here in Argentinian football in 1928 called the um, Ley Candado, hmm? like uh, can, Candado, <laughs> like I don't know how to say Candado in English, but it was a rule that make players to not change teams really easy. It was established for players that wanted to leave their teams and to go to another that offered them more money, but here uh, the football was amateur, still amateur. It was not seen well that chance or the, the chance that a player could think more in the money he could want than in the, in the football or, or the team he could play. So that rule established that a player should be playing in the um, reserve team of the club he was playing at the moment for one or two years, depending of the level of understanding between the clubs. If the club when the, where the player was playing was uh, agreeing to give the pass for the player, it will be one year. But Orsi had to play one year and a half, I think, in Independiente, still after the Olympic Games, to gain the chance or, or to to be able to be transferred to Juventus. He could not leave Independiente very soon because of that new rule. So they were fearing an exit. So this rule, was it created just because of this or... It was established before? No, oh, it was established before, not because of this, but it was established because the um, ruling of Argentinian football was a matter of 20 clubs. 20 clubs were ruling the National Football Association, were having votes and boys here in the council that took that kind of measures. So most of that teams were little teams, were not the big ones. And they were fearing the players to go to another team that could give them more money. So they, fearing that, established that new rule just to keep that players or to prevent that players to go to any other club, at least in, in an easy way. No, they had to play first one year if the clubs were agreeing the pass of the player. Or two years, even, if the clubs were not agreeing about that path. By the way, candado, I checked, it means padlock. And you showed oh. the handcuff motion. That's yeah. self-explanatory. <laughs> handcuff, yeah, handcuff. That rule was designed to stop players moving uh, clubs, basically, yeah. between different yeah. clubs. Yeah. yeah. And obviously what happened here is that Orsi and then Monty ended up playing for Italy and winning the 1934 World Cup. So was there any way that the Argentinian Federation could have anticipated that players would actually not just move clubs, but those players would actually end up playing for a different country and to move different countries? Was that discussed or was that a completely new idea that had, that had come along with Orsi? No, the first really important 
path was the one from Ligonati, from Newell to Torino uh, back in 1925 or 24. But the movement that really showed that an exodus could came it was the one of Orsi, you know? And it was first Orsi, but a little late was also Monti and Cesarini. Guaita. Hmm? Gua- Guaita to Rome. Guaita. Uh, yeah. And, well, it, it was an exodus, really, and we couldn't prevent that in any way. And, well, uh, that had to do also a lot with the Italian decision of, organizing or, or, and winning the 1934 World Cup because they knew they could be really empowered by that players, you no, know, like uh, Monti or Siguaita and, and De Maria, who were playing in Italy or for Italy at that time. And also Cesarini was playing for Italy before the 1934 World Cup he played in a match that is remembered by its violence against Austria. And Cesarini was injured at that match, and that was the reason why he couldn't be at the World Cup, because if he had been in a good physical condition, he would have been playing for Italy also in the 1934 World Cup. As far as Cesarini also, Paul, you know how in England you have the term Fergie time when someone scores an injury time? Yep. In I think in Italy they call it Zona Cesarini because yeah. I think he scored an injury time a number of matches. So Yeah. It was also a TV, a TV show, I think, in Italy that was called Zona Cesarini. Oh, yes. Uh, Just to quote then Italy manager Vittorio Pozzo that if they can die for Italy, they can play for Italy. So that's how yeah. they justify and, their selections. <laughs> and it's a really interesting fact or information about Pozzo that was that he visited Argentina in 1914 with Torino. He came here and he could check with his own eyes the quality of Argentinian players in a tour that Torino did through the Rio de la Plata. So it was really something, I think, important for him to know that it will be very good to form the national team with Argentina players. Yes. Argentina closed that a decade by gaining a measure of revenge and winning the 1929 Copa America on home soil ahead of Uruguay. How did the press build up this South American championship after the Olympics loss? Well, we knew we had the chance to show us and the world and the Uruguayans that we were better. So we tried to take advantage of that possibility to play here in Buenos Aires against the Uruguayans and to have our revenge. And, well, it was all prepared to win that South American championship and to show how better we were. And, well, it went well because we, for the first time with the unified football here, uh, for the first time with the one national football association, could think more in Argentina's benefit than in the benefit of the clubs or the Buenos Aires clubs. And we selected players or the manager of that team, who was Francisco Olaza, could select the players very freely and could call some players of the interior of the country, like Chivirini and Rivarola, that were really good players at the time. And, and they were really important in that title of 1929 especially uh, Rivarola, who was really a great player from Colón of Santa Fe. He was known as Captain Ears because he had really big ears. Getting back to club football, you touched on this earlier, but in, in our previous interview, we spoke about how English teams 
would tour and play friendly matches in South America in the early part of the century. Did those tours continue into the 1920s and was it just English clubs or were there clubs from other countries? And in the same way, were Argentinian clubs then touring Europe? You mentioned Boca in 1925. Yeah, apart from Boca, it was Gimnasia of Gimnasia and Esgrima from La Plata touring Europe in the late 20s. It was also a very huge tour and a very successful one. It did it, uh, Barcelona and Real Madrid in Spain, and it equalized Inter in Italy, the Inter of Giuseppe Meazza, well, Gimnasia, and Boca also were able to, to show the world the powerness of Argentinian football. And they had a good decision to take not only players from their clubs, but also from other clubs that borrowed their players, key players, to them in order to form a, a great team and like a national team to show the world how good we were. So in one hand, we had that kind of tours like Boca and Gimnasia once, and not, uh, we were not receiving really great teams from England in the 20s and not also from Europe in general. Chelsea came in 1929, but it was not a very good representative of British football. It formed two teams to come here, and it lost even by 5-0 with Union from Santa Fe. So they were not really the best to show how England football was at that time. During this decade of the 1920s, what was football's place culturally in Argentina? Oh, football in the 20s came to be our first national passion. It developed a lot, not only as a sport, but also as a cultural phenomenon, with lots of magazines and newspaper giving it a lot of space in its spaces, and they make football to define our identity and to confront us with ourselves with new characteristics of the Argentinian way of being, of not only playing a sport, but also of conducting in life generally. Uh, so football was culturally really important phenomenon here and was started to be told in a way or in, in a fashion that could serve us a lot to learn how we were, how Argentinians could be as a population with its own very characteristics, no? It was really a way to know that we could have a story independently from what it was the legacy of that British educators that came to Argentina in the late century before this, in the first times of Argentinian football. It was really interesting how some journalists started from that point and give football in Argentina that power to show us a new way of life a way of life that was emerging because of football and in football especially, but also in the society in general. And one of that journalist was an Uruguayan, was Barocoto. It, it was really interesting and very symbolic that one of that journalist that showed us how football could emerge in a new way was an Uruguayan called Ricardo Lorenzo or Morocoto, who wrote a lot of articles in a graphic about it. In closing, when this decade ended, going into the First World Cup, was this the high point of the Argentina-Uruguay football rivalry, historically, certainly in yeah. terms of world football? Yeah, sure. Uh, so that also the moment where the two golden generations of Argentina and Uruguay had in the 20s reached, I think, their peak 
or, or their highest level to be confronted with each other. So it's really interesting how they both have a similar development in the 20s, but Uruguay always was ahead from Argentina, always was giving first the steps that take them to the recognizement or to the possibility of winning titles. They were always ahead, always first than us. So that's why they really could get that title early. Next time, we'll discuss this decade of the 1930s, where this Olympics group would take part in the first World Cup in 1930, and once again, compete against their neighbors, Uruguay. That will be another fascinating discussion with many stories discussed. Once again, we would like to thank Mr. Beckerman for his participation in this series. As always, feel free to leave questions and comments. You may contact me on my blog and Facebook under Soccer Nostalgia. On Twitter, I'm at SP1873. Mr. Paul Whittle can be contacted on his blog, The 1888 Letter, as well as on Twitter, at 1888 Letter. You may also follow the podcast on Spotify under Soccer Nostalgia Talk Podcast. Mr. Beckerman can be contacted on Twitter at E-G-E-R-B-E-K and also at Entre Tiempos under slash A-R. And the links to his blog and the website for entretiempos.com are also listed on the blog and the Spotify uploads. So Esteban, thank you once again for a very interesting discussion and hope to continue these discussions in the future. Oh, thanks to you. It was really nice, I think, to continue talking with you about the Argentinian football story. It will be always nice to do. Thank you. Thank you very much, Esteban. That was great.